Welcome to the Waiting List Podcast. Tell us the story. It's like many things you start building from, from scratch. And then which, I'm like, wait, I really do like watches because... You, you've seen so many watches. That makes you excited. Yeah, I think I really, really do like watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great way to see if you are a watch enthusiast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second part of the Waiting List Podcast. Today we have, again, at Watch Mad Max. Thank you for your time again. Nice, and nice to be back here, Lung Lung. Yeah, Thank you. Um, I'm with my co-hosts, Alex and Dan. Hey. Hey, everyone. So um, thank you so far for bringing us through your remarkable journey and life and all watches. And I hopefully, well, I hope in this episode, we get to know you a little bit better on a more personal side. Um, okay, so in the previous podcast, you mentioned you moved to Hong Kong. Which other parts of the world do you want to explore? Um, well, let me start by just saying thank you very much for having me back after the first uh, first podcast. <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd probably not get invited back for another one. Or, um, so it's lovely. It's, it's nice to be back. So, we didn't uh, mean it. We, we needed you yeah. for like a podcast. Yeah. This so, like Long Long was the deciding vote. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you. Okay. Um, he didn't bring his 57 So my 5711, <laughs> yeah. uh, not bringing the rose gold 5711, uh, that sort of swung it for me, did it? Good. Okay. Um, uh, I'll bring the Maserati key ring. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm of a slightly different uh, generation um, from you, Lung Lung, and mm -hmm. um, I've had the opportunity to both live in many different countries and explore lots of different countries, and it's taken me both work and on a personal level. I've, I've been in so many parts of the world, and I think... We touched, I think, a little bit in, in the first uh, podcast around how one develops yourself as an individual and talking about, I think I talked a little bit, if I remember rightly, about stepping out of comfort zones. Uh, and it's by stepping out of your comfort zones that you can become more confident about who you are as a person, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and that, that that applies in travel. Now, by that, I I'm not talking about, right, I'm off to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower tick. Yep. Right, move on. <laughs> Venice, great. Done that. Fantastic. <laughs> Pisa, done that. Yeah. Leaning tap, yeah, sorted. <laughs> Hong Kong Harbour. Um, Hong Kong Harbour, light show, yeah. done that. Okay, <laughs> light show, right, tick, move on. Where London do we night. go now? Okay. London Eye, London Eye. Great wall, uh, <laughs> done that. Um, but, but I do think it's about... Um, having the opportunity to get under the skin of countries a little mm -hmm. bit more. And that, again, is partly the the beauty of being able to work in different countries as well or live in them. And I was lucky in that I grew up living overseas in different countries. Um, and, you know, I, I recognize the privilege of that yeah. um, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, so I have I have a big love and passion and affinity with wild places mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that sounds really trite yeah. <laughs> i can't believe i just said that <laughs> um but uh, um we'll leave so, that bit in. okay what, yeah. do, what do i mean by that i yeah. I, I love you know I th again i think in the first podcast we talked a little bit about you in order to have black you've got to have white yeah and, you know in order to have color you've got to have the gray mm -hmm. balance in life you need balance mm -hmm. in your life and you know we're all working hard and in successful jobs and it's pressurized and I like the release and the opportunity to get out there into right. far-flung places where help is not at hand and you're mm -hmm. self-reliant on yourself a little bit more um, and decisions have consequences so climbing mountaineering exploring different right. parts yeah. of the world from that perspective has always been something that's important to me okay um, I know you grew up in Singapore yep. I grew up in Singapore did you leave Singapore when you were going to university all right. So for me, the first time I realized, wow, I think very differently. I function very differently was in a university classroom. And then you meet all these international students. Then you realize I am like I did grow up in Singapore, but I'm not a very local Singaporean. Did, did that kind of um, I would say um, epiphany hit you when you were in university? Uh, no, I would yeah. say it didn't. It came before then. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the recognition of of um, my good luck, the the upbringing I had, and the mm -hmm. opportunities that that upbringing gave me, um, 
were made well aware to me from a young age. I think, you know, parents have a large part to play in that and how they, you know, how you um, are chaperoned, if you like, by your parents through that process of of growing up as a teenager and recognizing the privileges that you have. Um, I was, you know, I was an expat brat. So, you know, (laughs) I I love to, I love to, (laughs) I I was just thrown on a plane and told to to go off to boarding school for months at a time back in the UK. So I wasn't really growing up in Singapore, was I? I was was sort of, I had the best best of both worlds in many ways and sure, that I was yeah. uh, educated um, overseas and gr- holidays and home mm-hmm. was Singapore um, uh, so I think that was it um, you know I, I was aware of that from from boarding school uh, okay. of the differences for sure so what are some of the pros and cons of raising kids in different parts of the world <sighs> I think I I could I could answer this on so many different levels but for me it is about experiences and and giving your children I only have one son um uh um but giving giving children the opportunity to um see with their own eyes other cultures and 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 these are all little points of data that feed into who they then become later on and how versatile they become maybe later on in life in terms of their own. I always felt that growing up in the, uh, well, late 60s, 70s in Singapore and uh, in the uh, in the 80s, uh, w- we had a period in Australia as well. But it was... It was a slightly, and I, I'm I'm quite cautious about voicing an opinion on this because I'm also well aware of how fortunate yeah. I was in the little bubble that we lived in, yeah. um, uh, and it was different days back then in the 70s. Still, it was not long after Singapendence yeah. in 65. Um, and secession from from Malaysia, um, so it was quite it was a, it was an in- interesting time. All right. Um, me and Dan actually often talk about this. Um, we were parented very different. I was very sheltered. And Dan, um, even though I would say had a comfortable life, his parents actually made him work and made him understand the value of money. Um, how do you parent your kid in that sense? Because they obviously um, can see that they perhaps have a comfortable life in Hong Kong, but then how do you make them understand you got to work for your money. <laughs> Great difficulty. <laughs> 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 Can your parents share something with me, Dan? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> my background is like, actually, I went to boarding school too. Yeah. So when uh, Max says about he understands the privileges, I totally get where he's coming from because you're playing rugby in like some of the most beautiful mm-hmm. fields. You're very uh, actually aware of where you are in society. You know, Anybody that was coming from Asia mm-hmm. at that time was probably like royalty or something, yeah. Yeah. So you do, you do know. Um, something that my parents did is they took me out of private education and put me into state education. Mm-hmm. That kind of made me more in touch with this out of that bubble. You said, yep. Yep. right? Suddenly, I was catching a bus. I've never caught a bus before in my life. Otherwise, being a private car guy, that was so strange for me. Obviously. We're going back to going out of your comfort zone, totally out of my comfort zone. You know, when I first, you probably don't, I don't know if yeah. you guys know this. When you catch a bus, there's actually hierarchy in the bus. <laughs> no, I, no the there is. I love, I love that comment. You guys probably coolest. don't know this, but there's a hierarchy. In there's the a bus. hierarchy on this bus, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> and you can't immediately go upstairs. <laughs> what? Yeah, because it's reserved, like the back of the bus is reserved cool to six kids. formers. Oh, cool yeah. No, 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 six formers, right? So our first day, yeah, I don't know. I'm just looking for a seat. Yeah. <laughs> I go all the way back, right? I'll get the yeah. crap beaten out yeah. of me. Yeah. All the, <laughs> all the cool stuff? kids say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So those kind of experiences I had, you know, that transition. And then um, very quickly, I think when I was uh, 16, started, you know, my parents were like, okay, you, you're going to have to work. You can do some work to get your money. You know, I wanted to buy the new jeans. I wanted to, you know, I was a teenager. Right? I wanted to look good. I wasn't getting any money from them. So they were like, you've got to do it yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I, I can recognize bits of that, what you say there, Danny. Um, the, 
I, you know, I worked through holidays. So, yeah. you know, and uh, and I do the same with my son, you know, he, he's a perpetual university student, it seems to me. <laughs> um, uh, refuses to get out there into the real world and earn a living and releases dad from the, the shackles of having to give him a lot money. A bar time. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, yeah, son, if you're listening to this, go and get a bloody job with you. And, um, <laughs> Don't uh, worry, we'll get him a job. I'll get him a job um, to do. Uh, so, yeah, anybody needing a great guy in digital media and marketing, <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got somebody for you. Um, but uh, you know, it, but he he too, you know, in fairness, he you know, I don't pay him an allowance, for example, never have done during the school holidays or university holidays. Is get out there, get yourself a job, um, and then by doing that, then he appreciates what yeah. he does have. I hope a little yeah. bit more as a result. You should share with Mac um, how your dad um, taught you that lesson about not s- not sitting on the plants that were spiking. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. This sounds a good one. I told her this. <laughs> so, um, okay, we had a garden, obviously, <laughs> and there were sometimes weeds in the garden. And there was this particular weed that was quite spiky, yeah. right? So, obviously, if you sat on it, it would hurt your bum, yeah. right? It Especially when you're, in, yep. when you're in the summer as well. You're very, wearing very thin clothing. So I used to pretend, to pretend to sit on it with my brother in the garden, right? Obviously, I wasn't sitting on it. And I was like basically showing, oh, look how hard I am. I can sit on it. So then my brother, who's like six years younger than me, actually thinks I'm sitting on it. He goes and sits on it. He goes, it really hurts, man. It really hurts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, no. So typical house, you know, you, you see your dad. He's seeing out from the window, right? He comes straight out, takes me to the flower bed. Yeah, it takes me to the flower bed, puts a handful of soil and stuffs it in my mouth. Whoa. And he says, eat that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sitting there and then, yeah, that's what I had to do. Wow. I, like, he stood there. He didn't just do it and then walk off. Yeah, he yeah. stood there and eat that. Yeah. Right. And then he proceeded to beat the crap out of me. Life, <laughs> life lessons, life right? Lessons. Yeah. <laughs> you don't forget that one, <laughs> yeah. do you? Yeah, yeah, not that an was, hour. Eh? That but was it, bad. It would Obviously, my it. brother, <laughs> being non-the-wise, thinks, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Did he follow suit? Like eating from the flower bed as well? No, no, because he was no. He, the whole point, <laughs> yeah, exactly. dude. You obviously don't get. That. He was. <laughs> I get it. I'm just joking with you. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maxim's son's gonna be listening to this. Like, yeah, all right, I'm gonna get exactly. a job right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So speaking about watch communities, you said you learned a lot in the past five years, like since moving here, right? Yeah. yeah so sure. what is the watch community in Singapore like as opposed to Hong Kong? Well, of course, for, you know, I wasn't into watches when I was a teenager. Other mm-hmm. things had my interest. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, um, you know, it was, uh, but having said that, there's a, you know, one of the websites that I've, uh, one of the longest established ones, actually, mm-hmm. um, Purist Pro, Watch yes. Pro site. Um, uh, I've been active on for years. And interestingly, over here, there's a huge number of, uh, some of whom I think you know, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Taiwanese chap Lewis says hello. And, uh, <laughs> um, but, the, um, but they sort of took me in and sort of yeah. welcomed me in and said, uh, join in. So most of those are Singaporean-based. So a, and again, what I like about it is a, is a humility that runs through the veins of all yeah. of this. Um, that... Some of them have an incredible collections, um, but they're not there to show off about it. It's exactly, not about, yeah. you know, look at me and the bling on my wrist. And they get as much pleasure out of the simpler, cheaper end of the spectrum as they do from the more expensive mm-hmm. end of the spectrum. Um, and within that little group, we had a lovely little story um, last year where a couple of the guys organized a charity watch mm-hmm. um, with... Uh, Japanese watchmaker Hajime mm-hmm. Asioka. Oh, um, and he has a sort of sub brand. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how much you know about Hajime Asioka, but he he produces yeah. like yeah. five watches yeah. a year yeah. or something, mm-hmm. and that's it. And they're yeah. handmade. Um, so his sub brand Kurono. Yeah. Uh, Kurono Tokyo. Um, uh, apologies for my awful Japanese <laughs> pronunciation. Um, and what we got him to do was. And I say we, it was nothing, I can't claim any of the credit for this, but two of the guys in the group yeah. got, got him to do was a, a small edition in conjunction with Sincere Watches in Singapore. Wow. Um, yeah. And, cool. you know, a large part of the 
proceeds mm-hmm. of that watch all went to a charity in Singapore. So That's that was great. a nice little no, thing where the, the, you know, yeah. the community is kind of trying to do something to yeah. give a little bit back. Um, and it's a beautiful yeah, eggshell those, dial. It's stunning. It's yeah, those piece. watches, like whenever they launch, you go on the website and it's gone instantly. Oh, they've gone yeah. instantly. Mm-hmm. But yeah. this was the first of them. All right. And then he's seen... Subsequently, think, he did yeah, a few... He's developed a green dial yeah, and I saw, other different Yeah, the dials. green dial was amazing. But yeah. the eggshell one yeah. was the first. They're 37 millimeters. They're beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I love the classicism of them. I'm looking at it right now, actually. Um, but, uh, that, but the interesting point of that story mm-hmm. was how you know a, a group of people like-minded individuals are right. all getting together and doing something that hopefully is giving back a little bit for someone that was active on purist pro uh, well i know they still have a lot of farms nowadays do you kind of miss the the way that things used to be yeah i do nostalgia it ain't what it used to be i know yeah. um but the it's uh um and certainly the level of active participation in a lot of watch yeah. forums has declined because yeah. people are getting their kicks through other medium. Um, yeah. it's, it's WhatsApp groups, it's mm-hmm. uh, Instagram it's really, and yeah. you know, podcasts like this or whatever yeah. it might be that people are getting their outlet or their feeding frenzy from other f- sources. All right. Um, so we know that you visited several um, tour- factory tours in mm-hmm. Switzerland. Which one would you say is your favorite? <laughs> yeah. Put me on the spot again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking a bullet for you this time. Yeah. There's yeah. too many bullets I, there. I, I'm looking around now <laughs> thinking, right, who's going to take the bullet on this one? In choosing a favorite, I'm probably going to disrespect all the others. No, I'm not. Um, uh, Let's say one that impressed you, one that you kind yeah. of got. Oh, I'm happy to talk about a few because, okay. you know, I have been and I think it's an imp- important way in which you develop that affinity with a particular brand is having the opportunity and and uh, right the very first one i visited was vacheron constantin um in geneva um and i was my wife and i were taken on a private tour i didn't own a vacheron at the time uh, but a an authorized dealer in switzerland who i, I bought uh fp jean and i bought jj and i bought Patex from over the years and have a good relationship with, she said, look, I need to take you in to see Vacheron. Um, uh, so she organized it, and we went in for a couple of days into Geneva and had a tour around that. And that was a transformative moment for me. Um, there's a lot of, sm- let's step back, and this is not a Vacheron comment specific, It's there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the watch industry around in-house, mm. independent, yeah. group, conglomerates. Swiss-made. Swiss-made, not, whatever. And so one has to be curious about um, that acquisition process and your own education around how um, watches are or are not what they appear to be or are presented as being sometimes. Um, and... I think the value in visiting a manufacturer and getting under the skin and going in and seeing it being made um, and having the opportunity to ask questions uh, um, and see people doing their job um, helps you gather those additional data points to be able to make better informed decisions about what's right for you and what works for you on a on a from a perspective of collecting a piece. Uh, I hate to cut you off, but yeah. um, what were you thinking when you saw the people assembling the movements? That their the eyesight's going to go off because <laughs> they're looking <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it's like, my God. It's, yeah. uh, um, it, it's like how fiddly and how steady. And, yeah. I, you know, if I was doing that and yeah. had a drink last night, I would have <laughs> made a real, I wouldn't want to be the person buying my watch um, that I put together. But no, I think yeah. it, it that's the sort of jokey answer. Yeah. But the, the serious answer is, the level of attention to detail and it's the combination of the CNC and the CAD drawings and everything that yeah. ultimately goes towards putting that watch together and the assembly of it, mm-hmm. uh, the finishing, the polishing, you know, the dial manufacturer, it might be done by somebody else or whatever. Yeah. But in any event, to bring it back, Vacheron was the first one that I visited. Um, and I continue to still have a massive appreciation for and have owned Vacheron. Um, uh, for what they do um and it opened my and my wife's eyes to 
the whole watch mm. manufacturing process. So that was the start of the, an inquisitiveness, a curiosity about, I want to go out and see as many manufacturers as possible. Because you see um, a lot of people kind of question watch movements and finishing, but regardless, even if it was the most basic movement, the amount of effort and details that went into that, you kind of do have an appreciation when you see it get done. Uh, oh, and uh, that's something that we don't, we as uh, buyers, we don't get to really see. You no. see it from the YouTube video, but yeah. you don't really see it. No, absolutely. And, you know, not everybody's going to be able to go to go and visit a manufacturer. I realize that. Again, it's, it, it's, it's a... You know, there's some f good luck and privilege in, in having that opportunity as well. But it's something I've certainly um, made uh, made the most opportunity of that I can to be able to get myself out and inform myself and go around and visit manufacturers. I haven't been to one back in Switzerland since we moved here to Hong Kong five years ago, but you know, I, I will be going back and visiting other ones again. Well, that's not true. I've been back to AP. Um, uh, um, and actually, I've been back to Zhe Zhe. Yes. Can I just say senility? Yeah. Senility yeah. is it's setting no, it. I'll it's forget what wine. I own now. It's the wine. It's, it's the, the wine. wine. I've, I've only had wine. one glass. Yeah, yeah. lightweight. It's, it's, it's <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 no. um, but, but, you know, so I've visited Vacheron. I've been, I've been very lucky. I've been, you know, flown over to see Patek, um, put up and uh, spent a couple of days in Patek, uh, a couple of, uh, in several occasions. Um, been to Zhe Zhe, of course. I've been to AP of course I'm very much looking forward to going back to AP to see the new museum um, I just cannot wait to go and see that and going and seeing you know the beauty about the remaster sorry if I digress for a second Alex but the beauty uh, about the the, the, um, the remaster for me is that you know, if you go back through the history book of AP and mm. there's a great book mm. yeah. um, that charts, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, we charts all the different yeah. and it lists how many pieces were made over different yeah. years and so forth I think it's page 172 or whatever. I think it might be. I might be right in 172. You see the picture of that. And they made yeah. three of the remasters between 1941 and 1943 in, in two-tone. Three pieces, and that mm -hmm. was it, in two-tone. And, and when I saw it in the press release and then saw it in the flesh... I was telling the guys at AP, that's, that's in the complication. That's, you know, he made three pieces of that in 1940s, <laughs> and here you are. You've done. What a fantastic piece to do for the, for the manufacturing, the yeah, creation of the yeah. new museum. And I cannot wait to go back yeah. and see one of those pieces there. Do you think that um, this is a great way also for AP to draw attention to those vintage pieces and try and build up, build up that uh, vintage AP equity, brand equity? I hope so. Um, and it's and very if, if, uh, uh, yeah, yes, laudable it right now, isn't it? It's absolutely laudable. And when one thinks about um, how brands mm. continue to evolve, uh, there's a massive back catalogue of yeah. um, that they can draw upon to, to try and... And what I like about the remaster is they're not trying to recreate it. They're evolving it and doing mm. something that's completely different. Mm. You've seen JJ issue a lot of tribute pieces. I, again, I've got one here which has got a lovely story to it where um, uh, somebody's nicked it. Okay, no, there <laughs> we go. The 1968 <laughs> tribute to Polaris, um, uh, which... Um, you know, look at the look at the doming on that yeah. on that um, Glass. plexi, yeah, um, uh, and it's is true to its original. But then JJ have also drawn inspiration from their back catalog. AP with the remaster and not looking to re recreate. They're reinterpreting and reinventing what they did with That's the remaster, which I love. I agree. I think um, if you just copied it, it's actually not. It's a very smart uh, move that you've made something new from something which draws attention to the brand. You haven't copied it, so it doesn't detract from the old one. Yeah. And then people will still potentially go for that. Oh, that, this is the original one. This is the one that's, you know, there's only three pieces. It makes it very desirable suddenly. And, and uh, I think I really applaud AP for the bravery of creating the 1159, mm. for example. Um, and... Uh, it, it's a, a it's a piece that polarized collectors massively, um, and but I think the the ambition to to challenge assumptions about what AP are or indeed any brand 
should always be part of the motivation of management and leadership within within a brand. Now that would be whether it's Chanel or um, a what you know a, as a clothing uh, company or whether it be Car EP company. or anybody yeah. else as a, a watch company. You always want to be thinking about how you move it forward mm. and and create something for another generation of collectors who are your your ages or your your listeners' ages. And that's where again the six zero zero seven Patek. Mm. Um, I think it should be applauded. I personally am not a massive fan of it, but I think it has a fantastic place within Patek's stable of product. But with the uh, watch industry in particular, I find that it's very difficult because there's no rules or regulations to change it. What do I mean by that? So if I use the car industry, they've got CO2 emissions. So everything's going to move over to electric. You know, they talk about range, you know, and recyclable materials. With watches, we don't really have that issue. So they can kind of do whatever they really wish. So in the way, they could kind of rest on the laurels and be fine with it. So for them mm. to kind of get into a new demographic is not necessary. Cause well, that, that, there's a, another question in which lies within that is, um, are people going to wear watches? Yeah. So, you, 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 you know, you've got to face that challenge as well. So the, the industry has multiple challenges on, on the horizon, which it has to address. But what I, I'm an optimist by nature. I love to think positively. I prefer looking forward than looking back. Agreed. But if one looks back, you see you know, the, the challenges to the industry over, over the years. Um, most notably, we talked about in the last one, um, the courts crisis in the 70s. But they've addressed that and they've come through it. So I like the fact that brands are prepared to be uh, innovative to, ch to challenge their collector base assumptions about what they should be is that kind of why the smartwatch i mean in some ways they can say it has taken off but it hasn't seemed to really affect the watch brands as much as the quartz movement did what do you mean like it hasn't killed yeah. that yeah, the sales is still pretty strong for most of these watch brands if anything they're still going up well i think this year we've seen them go down okay, clearly I, I, um, so but but yeah, generally speaking yeah i it probably hasn't um I'm not sure that the smartwatch will be a point of differentiation as to success or failure of the mechanical watch industry, to me. Um, I think just people's priorities, whether they want to wear a watch or not, when other things can do that. My phone can tell me the time or whatever. Um, so I, I, I don't have... I don't have the crystal ball to be able to answer that one, nor do I have any depth of knowledge to feel that any va opinion I had would be valuable anyway. I mean, I did a, an interview with New York Times recently on this topic. And um, I actually said, I don't actually think it caters to the same to market as these watches. It's a different demographic because it's called a smartwatch only because you tie it around your wrist. But actually, it's more like a smartphone on your wrist, yeah. right? Because of what it does. I think that product will continue to develop if anything, hopefully those people, hopefully, migrate onto having s used to something having on their wrist and then appreciate mechanical or something like this. There's hopefully. a place for it. There's yeah. a place for both. I mean, I have a Garmin Phoenix. I have a Apple Watch. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a Sunto um, yeah. smart. You know, smart watch for you know for climbing and skiing and all this sort of stuff. So I have both. I don't see that they're necessarily mutually exclusive to each other it's kind of like jewelry because i guess it's not really necessary or important but people still wear jewelry right well back in the day right i don't think many people would have said oh you know because swatch watches right they saved the watch industry mm -hmm. right oh you know people buy swatches they might they might back in, back in that day thought yeah you're never going to go to a patek but actually they got you wearing a swatch got you wearing watches got you appreciating watches and yep, then agreed. eventually you got on and that's how you know and then like you, you buy you a Patek and ball. then you go back and buy a swatch watch which I've done yeah so I've done. <laughs> you know full circle yeah everyone wins everyone wins everybody wins, everybody wins. wins. yeah, yeah. All right, I got to bring it back to the yeah. 5711. <laughs> because it's actually, I knew I wasn't going to get yeah. away. Last time you okay. just... Yeah. Okay. okay, I remember um, I remember we were at an AP party and you told me that you were offered the 5711 in rose gold. Yeah. And um, er, so obviously everyone's thinking, where did you get it? Did, were you offered in Hong Kong? And I know you weren't offered in Hong Kong. And there's actually a very beautiful story. And I remember after you sh um, shared that story with me, I walked away thinking that's exactly the kind of relationship 
I would hope to see people develop in the watch, like in the watch world, that kind of relationship with the AD that actually is long, loyal, and it's not just about, like, for lack of a better word, like on the surface kind of a transaction, right? So, do you mind sharing the story with us? How, oh, who your AD is? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, well, it was an AD back in the UK uh, who I've I've um, been buying from for. Well, my wedding ring comes from them, yeah. so that's. Yeah. Oh God! I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have, <laughs> I shouldn't have gone down that road. I've got to now think you how long ago it was. Yourself in the <laughs> there. I'm just blowing it royally. Out. <laughs> um, Twenty-one yeah. years ago. There yeah. you go. <laughs> um, uh, um, so I've got a long and and before that as well. So I've got a long yeah. relationship with them, and they are a Patek dealer. They're a um, Rolex dealer and other and other stuff. Um, and, and a very very long relationship with Patek yeah. to the yeah. point where they've got their own. Limited edition world time. Wow. Um, oh, wow. Uh, 5130 yeah. uh, Patek, which wow. was done specifically for them. I'll give you a clue. I'm not going to sh- yeah. call out who yeah. the yeah. dealer yeah. is, but yeah. I'll give you a clue. It's got mm-hmm. a purple center. All right. Um, uh, um, to the 5130 world time. That means I have to do a tour around all of the I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, can, you can find it. 450 of them. There, there's your little hunt, hunt for after. Um, but so. And again, the team there I've know me, and the head of watch buying before going off to Basel mm-hmm. each year would usually just ping me an email yeah. or a message saying, "Is there anything you're looking out for?" And I'd said I'd gone back to him and said, "Well, there's all these rumours about a 5726 yeah. um, coming out with a blue blue gray mm-hmm, dial. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the uh, Nautilus on the bracelet, stainless mm-hmm. steel." Um, and I said, I'd, you know, I'd, if that's true, I'd be quite interested. Yeah. And um, and sure enough, it, it was announced. And he came back to me and said, well, we've got you down for it. So um, we'll get you, get you one of those. And and then in the meantime, what was interesting is it, it, AP came through and I got a Royal Oak Perpetual yeah. blue dial yeah. um, from AP. So I was really lucky with that. Mm-hmm. And then, I, so I started thinking about what I was doing and why I was doing it and where pieces fit within my collection. And I realized that actually, the 5726, I'd be buying simply because it's going to be the next big height watch and yeah. big thing yeah. and everybody wants yeah. stainless steel Nautilus. Mm-hmm. And that's wrong from, from my, you know, it was wrong yeah. for me. Um, so I actually emailed um, Danny, uh, the, mm-hmm. the watch um, buyer and head of watches, for the dealer back and say, look, I'll pass, um, and here's why. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll keep yeah. my credit for something yeah. else. And then a few weeks later, I'd been trying on a friend's. Mm-hmm. I'd been having a lunch here at the upper house with mm-hmm. a few watch friends. Um, and uh, Chapman, I won't tell say his name. It's not for me to do so. Um, let me try on his 57, yeah. ro- 11 rose gold. And I thought... Oh my God! I'm old <laughs> enough to be able to get away and wear that. Now. <laughs> so, and, um, and and I never thought I would say that to myself. And I thought, no, I I can wear that. That's okay. Yeah. So I emailed, and I didn't have a, any sense of mm-hmm. awareness as to how sought after they were. Yeah. I thought it was just sustainable yeah. steels. So I emailed my dealer back, North Rose dealer back, and said, I've just fallen in love with the fifty-seven, seven eleven rose gold. Yeah. What do you reckon? Um, uh, and a couple of weeks later, he emailed me back saying, yeah, I've got one coming in for you. We'll have it in, in the next week or two. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted people to hear because um, <clears throat> I know a lot of people listening is like, I can't believe he gave that piece up and everything. But it really is just being honest with your relationship with the brand, actually. You're yeah. forming a relationship that's truthful. You only buy what you feel you want in your collection instead of just picking up every piece that's been given to you, right? Well, a- absolutely. And, and yeah. you know, we we touched in the first episode about values yeah. um, and integrity for me mm-hmm. is one of, one, of, uh, one of them as far as I'm concerned. And so I want to deal with people the way I would hope to be dealt with by yeah. them. Um, so... Um, reciprocating trust and yeah. and um, and being honest and open with people mm-hmm. uh, is is quite important. And I felt that it would have been the easiest thing in the world just to take the fifty seven twenty six exactly, and flip yeah. it across yeah. and sell it and burn my bridges with yeah. the tech and the, the the dealership and make some money. Yeah. Well, my relationship with the brand is worth more than that. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's a really nice story. Yeah. I really like that. I resonate so with that. So. 
for people who are just collecting, I know one of the tips you have is um, never just look at the photo, go and try the watch. What other tips can you share with people who are just starting out? Well, first thing to say is it's not always possible to, to go yeah. into a shop and try the watch and mm -hmm. in case of sought after pieces. So I appreciate that, that can be difficult. And it also, not everybody lives in a city with authorized dealers. So, you know, a lot of the time you are now. Um, I mean, that's the beauty of where we are now in, in uh, current times with social media and the information sources out there. And, um, you know, the Waiting List podcast is a great opportunity, not through me, but through mm -hmm. other of your collectors to hear of people's journeys and experiences that they've had. So that will help shape and inform people's mm -hmm. thoughts, I suppose. Um, so initial research is one. But I think for me, the main piece of advice I would give is be prepared to make mistakes okay. and don't follow the herd. Okay. Um, experiment. Just accept that on the journey, if you're serious about wanting to build your understanding and knowledge of a brand, you'll buy watches for the wrong reasons. Okay. And that will happen. Um, uh, but accept that as just part of the journey of making some mistakes along the way to, to evolve your understanding. Did mm -hmm. you have that approach with collecting watches of going, not deliberately against the herd, but not being scared of going against the herd right from the start? Or at the beginning, were you buying and having an element of validation and you reached to a certain point where you thought, oh, actually, I can't, I actually want to do it this way? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I'm I'm as guilty as everybody. Uh, I, I certainly did that. I looked for validation. I bought watches. I mean, I've, I've given you examples. I bought a yeah. Lawn Jeans. I bought a, an Omega Speedmaster uh, yeah. as uh, Sapphire Sandwich as mm -hmm. my first watch. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I bought um, a GG Reverso mm -hmm. uh, as my All third right. watch. Um, and so it was very much a, a case of these were to some extent, easy decisions to make in terms of what I was buying um, because I was at a level of immaturity of knowledge and understanding of what was going to be important to me. Now, it just so happens that the Reverso has been, uh, the GG Le Coutre Reverso has been probably the most important watch in my entire um, collecting journey uh, right. because it, it absolutely has shaped uh, and JJ as a brand has absolutely shaped what's become important to me. But I've made plenty of other mistakes along the way in terms of other purchases, for sure. Mm, okay. All right. Fair. Um, I don't think this is your collecting philosophy, right? But um, I do have to bring up the about values and the prices of watches, right? Has it ever crossed your mind when you're buying a piece, um, whether the value will go up, whether it will drop? Yeah. Um, it does. I okay. think it, it's, it's, I think, you know, I would be lying. I suspect mm -hmm. I, I, I actually think most people would be K lying to themselves, lying to yeah. themselves a yeah. little bit if they, if they didn't I acknowledge agree. that there's an element of that. Definitely. So, yeah. you know, uh, because you're going to do the same when you buy mm -hmm. a house or you're going to do the same when you, um, uh, buy a car, mm -hmm. you know, you, you buy a car, you drive it off the showroom forecourt and unless it's <laughs> some, you know, massively sought after um, Ferrari, which you've had to go down years of buying and um, trading up different Ferraris to be able to get allocated that particular car. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't have a Ferrari and never have done. Um, just a uh, lad. disclaimer. Lad. Yeah. Um, uh, not because I don't love them, but um, uh, um, so, um, you know, I think mm -hmm. the value proposition it does become important mm -hmm. and at some point you you have to acknowledge that you're worrying about okay i i walk out of the shop and what's it going to be worth tomorrow mm -hmm. um but i desperately try not to let that be the principal driver or motivation behind why i buy or sell or watch all desperately right. try all right yeah i think the price is so always something you consider just let's say forget about like if it's going to go up or down what you available or else is available on the market that gives you value for money, right? Like maybe at that mm -hmm. same price, you you got a time only watch, but at this at the exactly the same price, you can have a perpetual chrono, right? It it's a, that's you have something you weigh up. You have to factor in the price, right? Yeah, and and you factor it in based upon what's in your uh, collection as well, and what you ha already have, and weigh up as to whether you know you can you can easily spend on a 
uh, an Acrivia or, you mm. know, you could buy a Kari Vutulainen or uh, a Grenfelt or a Hajime Asioka mm. or an FP Jean three-hander and mm. it's going to cost you the same as you can quite easily spend on some ultra-high-end mm. complication from another brand. I mean, you know, in terms of value proposition, let's look, I mean, I'm just going to call out one now because I've never bought it, but mm. the Mont Blanc Minerva movement, yeah. Monopoussoir, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chronos, wow. Yeah, I mean. 200 and something thousand uh, as a, a value proposition for that and you turn it over and you look at the movement it's, it's not far off your data graphs uh, mm. and it's not well, it's not there <laughs> 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 no I'm not having okay, that okay, I'm okay, not okay. having that okay it's not there but it's you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, know it's, you, I know what you're saying you know what I'm saying yeah, what in saying. terms yeah. of it's not far from your remaster. What you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay. Touche. <laughs> uh, yeah, got me back. Um, so, yeah, you do think about it. Okay. It's a sure long, long. All right. Let's um, talk about your wife because she has a, I would say, a very beautiful collection I'm very envious about, right? So how did she get into watches? And do you have any influence over what she buys? Help his allocation. <laughs> here, here's, here's a dangerous question to, <laughs> to leave me with, isn't it? Um I, uh, God, I'm speaking for her, and I, I hate speaking for my wife. Um, uh, she, uh, no, I think it, I, she would definitely say it's, it's through me that she got into watches, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. All right. Um, I mean, she's, but, you know, I was going to say what I love about her, but <laughs> probably one of the many things yeah. I love about her <laughs> should be the way it's I the main phrase it. Speaking uh, from experience. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I've learned that one. Yeah. one of, um, is, is that she's been very happy to sort of accompany me on this journey. And she's yeah. visited many of the manufacturers, you know, mm -hmm. Parmigiani to AP to Gégé to Vacheron to Patek and yeah. others as well. So uh, she's been around all of those with me. Because I want to hear more about Parmigiani, because that's one that you kind of mentioned to us briefly. Yeah, okay. So we didn't, we didn't get to hear about that in regards to a factory tour. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, quickly, uh, we were driving down. A again, it was the same AD in Switzerland um, who she's she's been really responsible for trying to build my knowledge and understanding. And so she set up the factory tour. Um, uh, she didn't come on it with us, but it was just my wife and I. We drove down from the UK to go down to to Pam, to Parmigiani Flurier, so Le Flurier. Um, and uh, I'll tell you afterwards about another interesting experience on that with our car, which um, caused us all sorts of trouble on the way back. Um, but uh, <laughs> That's why you don't have a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, but w I think what, and I don't own a Parmigiani, um, Fleurier, but I have. A, I mean, you look at the Torix uh, and, and the Tondas and stuff. The passion involved in that and the finishing level of detail, in particularly the Torix, I absolutely think is phenomenal. But the Sandoz Foundation, which Michel Parmigiani basically started, um, we—I uh, I don't know if this is strictly true or not, but a lot of how he de developed was around repairing pieces for other brands. And then the Sandoz Foundation stepped in. I think I'm getting my history right here, and apologies if it's slightly wrong. Always check your facts, <laughs> listeners, um, <laughs> because the speaker might not be telling the <laughs> truth. Um, uh, um, Sandoz Foundation stepped in, having asked him to repair a lot of the, the pieces within the foundation, then gave him the wherewithal to start his own brand. And I remember going upstairs across the road from the manufacturer, and anybody who's been fortunate enough to visit it will know what I'm saying here, um, is where the rep repair and restoration department is. And you go upstairs, and I think there were four benches and four watchmakers who all they do is repair and restore old pieces. And I think they were one man down at the time. They were down to three. And I could have spent hours in there. I could have absolutely spent hours in there talking to them about and pulling out the little wooden drawers and seeing the old pieces. And it's the same in AP, actually, upstairs. In AP, in, in the manufacturer there, you go up into the restoration department. That's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. Or JJ, and you go into the history books and see the, the, the archives, if you like. I mean, that, that for me, just inspires me ab about the future of horology. 
At some point, we will have to do a tour of that. That sounds really mm. fun. I, I have to say, um, so I went on the AP tour, yeah. and I know what you're talking about, that room, and yeah. there's all these drawers, and I remember thinking, is this fake? Are they actors? <laughs> like, do they really work here? It's so nice that I was like, they can't be working here. It's all made out of wood. <laughs> like, everything's wooden. Like, uh, well, if, you think view, it, if you think about it, if you go back to, you know, Patek's and things where yeah. they brought, brought in Ebush, eb- ebushes, mm-hmm. yeah. um, the the sort of made or pre-made yeah. uh, uh, movements, the and, uh, and they would just leave them sitting there in a drawer, mm. yeah, um, potentially for years until they said, right, we got, we need that one, and we went yeah. back in, and mm-hmm. they yeah. disassembled, refinished it, and yeah. put a module on it or whatever. So uh, it is a bit like yeah. that. It's cool. It's very cool. Right, we gotta bring it back yeah, to your sorry. your yeah, wife. wife. Oh God! Okay, so <laughs> now, Alex, last thank time. you. I, I, yeah, that was brilliant. But, but this <laughs> funny. Sorry, I tried to get you out I, of we it. We nearly <laughs> got away from it, no, but Lung Lung's no. got me back. Because this is really <laughs> funny. Like um, every time we meet you. Um, you have these stories about how you break the news to your wife when you bring <laughs> the new piece back, right? That's the hard one. So what does the approval process look like? Buy her another bag or take her out oh, yeah. on holiday. <laughs> Or do you uh, just bring it home? And that's how, I think you ha- how you sell that watch to her. There's a lot oh, of yeah. listeners here where uh, who can benefit from this because I've heard ridiculous <laughs> stories about them going on about like, no, this is my dad's watch. Someone owes my dad <laughs> money. Like there's all uh, sorts of stories. So. O- honesty and openness. You know, we, yeah. talk, we talked about it. I, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't hide, uh, hide it from, uh, from her. Um, I like making up a few yeah. stories, mind <laughs> you, just to wind her up. But uh, like uh, actually... Friday night, I came home yeah. with a four thousand uh, dollar Hong Kong dollar Seiko yeah. okay. um, uh, Chrono mm-hmm. uh, collaboration with Nano um, in Japan, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it has a vague resemblance at, at best, very vague resemblance to a Paul Newman Daytona. <laughs> okay. um, so <laughs> I, I came in, <laughs> I said, and I had it on my wrist behind my back, and I said. Um, you know, I've been following the auctions recently. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and I said, what have you done? Yeah. And, and, and I, I said, mm, well, I'm really sorry, but I couldn't not. <laughs> I had to buy this piece and I got it. Yeah. And I said, what is it? And yeah. I just sort of flashed my wrist. Yeah. And put it away <laughs> and I said, what's that? And I said, well, it's a Rolex. Yeah. It's 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Newman and 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 then she just went ballistic. <laughs> 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 well, not quite, but nearly. And then it was um, uh, and she uh, and then I had to, to a point where I had to confess, it's okay, darling. It's just a Seiko, <laughs> um, a very good Seiko, and a, but just a Seiko. It's not a Paul Newman Daytona. And she said, "You know what?" And she was yeah, really cross. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I didn't think it was. A Daytona, is, a, a Paul Newman Daytona is 369. And that's, <laughs> that, and I thought, I've created a monster. She could, she could tell at a glance said, that's that That's not very wasn't. funny. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't offended by the price. She was offended that it was yeah, a fake. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, that it was a Seiko, not a, a, a Paul Newman Daytona. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. She, she's, yeah. I, don't, I don't hide stuff from her and she embraces it, but... There is an element of guilt that every now and then <laughs> requires me to perhaps <laughs> buy something in return. To be fair, if it was a Paul Newman, yeah. though, she could wear it too. Yeah, she, yeah she's probably right? thinking, nice can I, so I, so I don't think she'd be complaining. She wouldn't be, <laughs> she wouldn't be unhappy. <laughs> and I, my biggest problem is stopping her stealing, stealing. And wearing all my <laughs> stealing. watches anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Stealing. Yeah. Such a strong word. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you stole my watch this morning. <laughs> and, well, it went with my outfit. So, um. <laughs> all right. So um, you mentioned you have a son. Any pieces you are thinking of? Passing down to him, uh, son? No, none <laughs> at all. Get a job, get a job first. Get a job. <laughs> um, uh, the I well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I don't. Uh, the whole Patek strap line is a bit corny, isn't mm-hmm. it? But the um, I certainly, um, you know, I, I. We talked earlier about parenting and everything. Yeah. So I used to have this fun game with my son when he was probably eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Then he'd say, "Dad, come on, there's cooler things out there." But we used to go through watch magazines, yeah. and I'd be flicking through them and reading, and he'd be sitting on the sofa beside me and yeah. be looking at, "Oh, that's cool, Dad." And I said, "No, it's not cool." <laughs> um, and then I don't know if you know the program yeah. Top Gear. Yeah. Well, they had the cool wall. Mm-hmm. Um, so we used to do this whole thing with the cool wall, and it was cool watches. Is yeah. that cool or not yeah. cool? Yeah. Or was it sub zero? So we go through and we do that mm. whole thing, and 
I had my Omega C, uh, mm-hmm. Speedmaster was what I was wearing a lot mm-hmm. back then. Um, and he just loved it. And he loved looking at the movement on the mm-hmm. back and operating the, yeah. the clutch. The chrono levers, um, and uh, and so I said one day I'll give that one to you, uh, mm-hmm. and I said well maybe for your 18th birthday. So 18th birthday comes along, and he said, Dad, do you not remember you said you're <laughs> going to give me something for 18? Said, Mate, you're no way responsible <laughs> enough. Not happening. <laughs> and maybe when you maybe when you get to 21, 21 comes along, Dad. Uh, no, you just dropped out of university. No way. I'm Surprisingly, it when it comes to these kind of things. Kids have good memories, hey? Yeah, they do. <laughs> exactly. So, fit of this way, he's now got it, and he loves it. So, yeah, I mean, I think, and That's I think really he, nice he, he really, honestly, it came as a surprise when I did finally give it to him. Yeah. Um, what a special moment. Uh, yeah. So, it was a lovely moment, and he was pretty blown away by that. Just not because it's, yeah, I mean, I'm sure this, from a value proposition wise, is other pieces he would love to be given right now, mm-hmm. but, um, but it's because of the history that the two of us had yeah. with that particular watch. That means hopefully that'll be his watch to my dad's yeah. gift to me on my 13th birthday watch. Yeah. Sort of equipment. That's really sweet. Very yeah. sweet. Yeah. All right. Last question before we move on to the quick fire, um, because you did mention you're a very optimistic p- person. So I think it's great for people to hear this um, with the pandemic, with COVID and possible recession. Um, how do people stay motivated and uplifted during this time? Generally speaking, mm-hmm. um, generally, I think both professionally from a work perspective and obviously on a personal level within you know that that context, um, I've seen us uh, on a global level and obviously in some countries and in some economies more so than in others. But I've seen a number of um, times where we've been through challenges from early 1990s mm-hmm. through the tech boom bubble mm-hmm. burst in the early 2000s through the GFC in 2008. Um, I don't necessarily think any of them are directly comparable to what the world is going through and seeing right now. Um, but I do think we have to be mindful and the optimist in me reminds myself that um, there are continents and countries that are equally facing challenges uh, whether it be of a pandemic nature or poverty generally, um, that means that you know th- what we're experiencing now is such a shock to us because of the privilege that we're in at the mm-hmm. moment. So I think yeah. you know being being mindful of that is is one thing. Um, I think that one just has to to recognize that we will come through this at some point yeah. and things will rebound uh, and you know looking after ourselves looking after our family and think families around and friends around about us is is the most important thing right now and just continuing to live your own values mm-hmm. in the way that you hope that All right. people look at you and say that's you know that's uh, great advice thank you all right that's so really inspiring yeah you know. Um, so I think for you, okay, so, okay, okay right, so uh, this was not a range, so you mentioned it quite <laughs> funnily, <laughs> like right. humorously, so we're not yeah. doing quick files with you today, All right. so you, okay. qu- you actually just mentioned it just now, it's oh the gosh. core, okay. so we've actually put it into three columns rather than a four, so we've got one that just literally says no way, which means, yeah, you're not going to ever buy, and it, by the way, you have to imagine this with your own money as well, it's not just, I, I know what he's thinking, stop. how do I do this without pissing all the brands yeah. off, I know, <laughs> that's <laughs> already what he's thinking, Danny, Dan, are you going to take a bullet from me on one of these as well, <laughs> <laughs> what? Look one could take a few. All right. <laughs> okay, so so you've got no way as in like Ready. you won't use your own money to pay for whatever reason. You've got one which I call let's say weekend thrills, which you might have and then you might flip. And then um okay. this one actually called Keeper, which you will actually not sell. Yeah. So gotcha. I don't know what these watches are, I just print a, a load Okay, of them you shuffled them all I up. I did shuffle them okay. up. So the first one is actually oh it's oh, a oh, <laughs> it's a steel oh. nautilus. So where'd you put that? <laughs> Wow. Well, g- given everything I given everything I've just said, it's really in the no way camp, isn't it? But, but, um, uh, look, I'm a massive Gerald Genta fan. Um, so if I were allowed to say that this is um, dial agnostic and um, metal agnostic, i.e., it could be gold, is going to be in the keeper brand. This one, though. No. If it's this one, one, then oh. I think it's one that you own for a bit. I feel that you have to try, and I, I'm a big believer in trying different models and tr- seeing how they go. 
Okay, so I, I top apologize for listeners because we don't have imaging. It's actually the 5711. Yeah, blue. 5711, stainless so, steel, blue dial. Okay, so the second one. And Angus, uh, and Mac has put it in... Uh, for a night. F- for, for weekend night. thrills. For night, weekend thrills. Okay. It's a try, a try one, yeah, for sure. Okay, so the second one is the... Oh, 116500 oh, ceramic Daytona. Oh, he's put no way, straight into the no way. It wasn't like Whoa, a consideration. That was fast. Yeah, no, it's just, uh, I mean, if I was going Daytona, I, I would go, I would go 6263, I'd go old school, I'd Ooh. go vintage, I would go, um, I would go Zenith movements, or if I was going modern, I would go white gold blue dial. Do you mm. think this will be a future classic? Um, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, there's one that, okay, I can't have any favoritisms, but this is one that's kind of close to me, so <laughs> Laurent Ferrier. Oh, ah. <laughs> no favoritism at all. Do you know what? Um, I thought you said you printed off these without looking. I didn't. I didn't look. I just printed them randomly off. Ooh, this is going to oh. burn some bridges here, isn't it? <laughs> um, um, no hard feelings. Just put it in the no way. I'm going no way. <laughs> okay. And I, I'll explain to you why very quickly. It's because um, I think they've got one of the nicest hands in the entire industry. I love those Asagi spear mm-hmm. type hands. I don't know what they technically I call, call them. The, I call them the uh, Cupid's arrows of love. Okay. They're <laughs> stunning. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Laurent Ferrier himself worked at PP for so many years. Um, and, I, you know, he's doing fantastic stuff, but there's only so many independents that I can focus on. Okay. Good oh, answer. another one. There's Good a answer. Portuguese chronograph, so the um, uh, the classic one. I guess that's they've got the new movement now, so that's the uh, 41 millimeter. Yeah. Classic IWC 3714. I've never had an IWC, mm. so I'd try it out. I'm curious, out of all your... Never had an IWC. Interesting, interesting. Things about that. Okay, Piaget, Altiplano, Extra Thin. Where's that going? Oh. Oh. I can I can feel the uh, <laughs> oh, no, you struggle here. Put it in the middle column. It's, it's, it's gonna. It would definitely go into the. I would be in. You know, it's one I love and I really appreciate. And when you hold that in the hand and see the fin- yeah. finesse of it, yeah, um, stunning. So that's all right. Put it as well. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Now the this one, the Speedmaster. Mm. Mm. Well, speed I'm gonna. Master. I'm gonna. Oh. It's got to be in a keeper, but I gave it to my son, so it's not really um, a keeper. So is the it? first watch, um, he's put the Omega Speedmaster into the keeper section. Very, Very quickly. Choice. Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. This one, the Zenith El Primero. That specific one that you're holding the picture of in in your hand. Okay, I'll give this one a. Uh well, am I allowed some <laughs> latitude? <laughs> allow, you to change, allow you to change. I want to see what level you can go up to. Okay, no, any, I, any model. I, I mean, I, I've had Zenith El Primeros for sure, um, and again, when one thinks about the position of a movement or a particular watch within the, um, the history of horology, then the Zenith El Primero is like, oof, it's an icon. Um, so, uh, it's definitely one. Also, the vintage ones look better than the ones today, though, Ryan. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of the um, the, Panda the revival, have. the Panda dark, revival. the dark one in a full. Yes, um, I have. Uh, yes, I have. Kind of like that. That's, that's quite. quite nice. But it's quite square case, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's so lovely. But it's that's one of the very watches, retro. Though, that mm. looks so much better on the wrist yeah. than in photos. You yeah. have to really try that one. Correct. Though. Agreed. It's definitely one to try. Agreed. Mm. Um, so this one, oh, this one. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. <laughs> it's a Gerard Perrigo Freak with a sapphire. Right, okay, uh, that no, is a no way. No way. No. <laughs> yeah, no way. Yeah. Okay. But this is the Neo Bridges, I think, isn't it? I may be wrong, but yes, I, think I think it so. is. Again, if one thinks about what they've done with it, it's yeah, a phenomenal yeah, piece of yeah. creativity and correct. engineering. But not in that look. It, it doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> okay. Odysseus, Lang and Sunny. Uh, so uh, there you go. You really uh, no way for no me. Way. <laughs> um, uh, again, just personal. Um, I, I've I've tried it on my wrist. I've yeah. I've seen it in the flesh. So I'm not just commenting from observation from afar. Um, uh, I think they've done a pretty amazing job with it. But I would have preferred the ability to swap out the bracelet. Okay, so for me that's one. Well, I think they're coming up with a rubber. They have. Have in precious shot. metal only. Oh, right. So okay. they're not going to have that on. You know, the stainless monster, steel yeah, stainless. optionality, and when you stack it up against, say, a Vacheron for me, where you got that optionality mm-hmm. with the bracelets. What have you got <laughs> in your hand now? Coincidentally, <laughs> <laughs> the next one is the Vacheron overseas. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, just, it's just, it's no coincidence. This is just like. 
So when we talk about keepers, does that mean I've got it already and would no, always it, keep it? Or if yeah. I bought it, I would always keep it? So just mm. like you never had these watches, you got the money, you bought that watch, would you keep that and not sell it? Yes, I think I would keep that. Um, because I think particularly, so what I'm looking at here is the blue dial, which is probably not the one I would buy, actually. I'd probably buy the black dial. Um, uh, Three-hander date in stainless steel. Um, if it had been the chrono, I wouldn't have bought it. Mm. Has to be time only. Okay. And there's okay. reasons which I suspect we we may or may not come on to, but if we don't, I'll tell you why at the end of this quick session. Keep that, we'll keep that for the next podcast, maybe. So the uh, Blanc uh, Pan Bathyscape? Right? Bathyscape, yeah. sorry. Yep. I apologize. Which size? I'm going to say that's 41. Is it the Hidinki version or is it the I'll standard you answer version? I'll that one. I'll let you choose um, whichever you like. Uh, <laughs> so that's a no way. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it gives me the opportunity to tell you why. Right, it's because yeah, of the date right. window at 4.30. Yes. Um, right. So Which is the same same principle with, with the, the Vacheron Chrono because it yes. has the date window at 4.30. And so the code. For me and the code, and yes. I've, I've fed that back to AP. So if you had given me the sort of love child of... Ver, ver, uh, what series two and series three of the um, Vacheron with the big date at 12 o'clock on the chrono um, with the interchangeable bracelet that would have been perfect okay. I love that word love child <laughs> first time it's appeared <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it's so, we, <laughs> so we have the Jaeger Reverso but not any Reverso but the original oh that's going to be a keeper oh, you, oh. you know it's yeah, a keeper yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah. this is actually the tribute yeah, uh, yeah, that one. 1931 tribute yeah. so yeah, that I own it. So <laughs> I would put that there yeah. if I had that. Okay. So we have now, okay, very difficult one here. So Rafa Nadal RM3502. So the 02. Um, it's, the, it's the auto. Yeah, I know. Th so I passed up the, the very first of the RM35s. Uh, I love this, so it would be a keeper. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> I particularly, I don't think that's aged well, but that's my <laughs> opinion. Yeah. It's a nice size, though. That's yeah. a good yeah. thing it's about it. It fits, fits very, fits very nice well yeah. on the wrist. Well, this one kind of makes sense. So <laughs> What's that? It's 59.70 because of the lugs. Oh, it's 59.70, so it'd be a no yeah. way. He's lying. He's lying. Well, it's so... Uh, yeah, the... <laughs> the Actually, that looks like a 5270. It's a 5270. But it's a... So what you're showing me is a Patek... Perpetual calendar, chronograph, uh, white, gold, black dial, um, no chin uh, on it. Um, so, yes. Uh, Always a I keeper. Would have that. Always keeper. Right. Yeah. Iconic okay. and classic. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, this one. 15202. <laughs> is it the IP or <laughs> yeah, is it the same? The <laughs> In respect of what Longman uh, says, this is yours. Yeah, yeah. So Always keeper. So He's not bitter, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's interesting. I've got a number of rollers uh, and, and the 202 is as close as you can still get to Gerald Genta's original design. Uh, the stainless steel and the blue dial is absolutely perfect. The, the one thing that you have to reconcile yourself with is the absence of a sweeping second or any second hand. So there's no visual movement clues in, in, the, in the dial, which is why I, I also like my 15300, um, mm. which is the same size 39 millimeter. Is it, sorry, is yours is white dial as well? Mine's a white yeah. dial, 15300. Uh, okay, so... We haven't spoke about Seiko, so we're going to do Last it now. Three. But it's going to be Credor Aichi 2. Mm. I'm going to upset you, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm putting it in the no, no just way. Put it straight um, in there. <laughs> so put a dagger into his heart. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Both brands um, like. No, I mean, that would be, that's definitely one I would love to try. Yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. I can see you in that one. Yeah. Um, um, two? Yeah. Right, okay. So, so I would definitely give the Credor okay. a try. So that's the. FP Jean, the oh. new perpetual oh. candy. Oh, right um, so I'm a massive fan of FPJ. I'm a massive fan of the perpetual calendar and what he's done with the, 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 the most recently announced version in rose gold, blue dial, or um, uh, I think it's white gold, not platinum. It might be platinum. But, um, I think it's white gold, yeah, actually. White gold, white gold. Uh, blue dial. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that in the flesh. Okay, the last one I'm not really interested in is the Hublot Big Bang. Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, you can pick one. Okay, you take it then. <laughs> you take the well, yeah, you can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go, Lung Lung. You know what? That is Thank my you gift to you. Next for time we play this <laughs> game, yeah. give it to Long Long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Follow says give it to Long Long. I'd like Long. to see it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, actually, that's what you need to do. You say, there's no way, yeah, and then even left Long of no Long way Long. is yeah. give it to Lung Lung. <laughs> okay, so, all right, so what 
um, so Mac has done in yeah. his keeper list. He's got the Reverso, the Vacheron Overseas, um, the Rafa Nadal RM, Speedmaster, 15202, 5270, and also the FP Jean. Now, we've got a couple of minutes. If you was to pick, let's say, two of these watches, which one would it be? I won't... Oh, straight in there. Whoa, uh, straight in there. No, okay. you're, I, think you're, a, I think it's a relatively easy choice, actually. You're, you're presenting me options, which if it had been a different reverso, I would have chosen a reverso every day of the week. Um, actually, what I, what I picked out there is two perpetual calendars. So I'm going to change that choice and I'm going to go the Richard Meal. Um, ah. and the 5270. But what I, what, is, what I see looking at that is just how vanilla I've been in my choices. I mean, they're pretty obvious choices. So I've, I've kind of, we're finishing this story on a somewhat depressing note, which is, <laughs> which is uh, for <laughs> everything I've said, yeah, for yeah, everything yeah, I've I said, I've I've just <laughs> <laughs> I've just gone for the you obvious. I've just gone for the obvious. You know, this, so. this hour and a half, let's just forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you'd got some more interesting, more challenging <laughs> ones that you, you had I'll there. bring you again next time. Mm. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mac. That was really fun. If you guys want to listen to more, please follow us on Instagram. Um, you can find us on Spotify. Uh, leave us a comment. Um, like us, follow us. and Apple Podcasts too. Yes. Thank you again, Mac. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, so, 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 yeah. Yeah. so, much. Thank you, Daniel. Have have really enjoyed it. Thanks afternoon. very much indeed. All thank right, you. guys. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Waiting List podcast. Hit the subscribe button and the next episode will come straight to your phone as soon as it's ready. Whilst I'm here, please remember to leave a nice review and follow us on Instagram at the Waiting List Podcast.